Okay. Okay, we are going to start the live case and the lecture session four. Uh, I'm H.S. Uh, Kim from SN Hospital. My co-moderator is Dr. Fel Ted Feltman. He's really a great guy in this field. We have an uh, eminent discussant for this session, Dr. Chen, Dr. Chen, Dr. Chong, Dr. Hayashita, Dr. Kim, Dr. Lin, Dr. Marino, Dr. Posas, Dr. Wojciechowski, Dr. Yu. Please have a seat. And uh, we are going to have a live case demonstration from Assam Medical Center, case three and four. The first operator for the case three is Dr. Darren L. Walters. Hello? Okay, the, uh, the room is uh, case four. The first operator is Dr. Togu Park. Yes. Please uh, present your case. We are all ready. Okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you for uh, Dr. Kim and uh, uh, Dr. Ted Feldman. And uh, we are the prepared the, our the typical uh, live case uh, transfemoral tarver uh, and uh, we have uh, some heart team uh, my left side is a cardiac surgeon is a Dr. Ju and he is a chief of our the cardiac surgeon part in our heart team we have some very harmonized heart team in our country and uh, my right side is uh, Dr. Gang uh, he will support me and the uh, technician is uh, the, uh, the, uh, the team and also the up there and the uh, echocardiographic part our faculty Dr. Hope prepare and there is a uh, uh, anesthesiologist, anesthesiologist uh, uh, faculty is a uh, Dr. Kim is a uh, preparer is uh, uh, our heart team is prepared the whole case okay Dr. Kang is can you present patient history yes uh, this patient is a 84 year old male admitted with effort chest pain for three months. He had a history of ischemic heart disease and performed PCI at LAD and at circumflex and right coronary artery for three times. The coronary angiography showed patent stents and patent coronary arteries, but the echocardiography showed severe degenerative aortic stenosis with normal left ventricular secretory function. Next. Uh, she, had, uh, he had, uh, she had a history of ex-smoker and age 84 and male sex. So his STS score was 2.6% and euro score 2 showed 1.3%. Next. And his echocardiography revealed LV ejection fraction 61% and peak and mean pressure gradient showed 71 and 45. Estimated aortic valve area was 0 0.65 square centimeters. And also uh, coronary CT angiography was done, which showed the result. The coronary and aortic CT showed ruptured plaque and abdominal aorta, but the lumen area was sufficient about eight millimeters. Next. And the Arctic valve annulus area showed 423 square millimeters with short diameter 20 millimeter and long diameter 26.5 millimeters. Next. The sinus of valve size was 897 and ST junction area 541. Next. LVOT showed minimal calcium with a size of about 400 square millimeters. Next. The coronary calcium estimated with Hounsfield unit over 850 showed 268 um, uh, cubic millimeters. Next. And coronary height was sufficient over 40 millimeters. Next. And this is the sizing chart of Sapiens 3 we use. And for the Sapiens 3 valve size 26 millimeter, it has 22% area oversizing. So we 
uh, decided to use 26mm Sapien 3 valve with 2cc underfill. So we uh, want to match the size with the 15% oversize. Keep, keep it this yeah. So, And uh, I'm going to summarize this patient is 84-year-old uh, male yes. and uh, the previously three times uh, PCI a couple of years ago. And uh, looking at the STS score, is a 2.7, yes. just uh, literally is a low risk score. And we have uh, some hot team discussion weekly. We consider a lot of the patient clinical characteristic and also STS score and also the several mobility and the, the in the, the in-depth discussion of hot team and that this patient is a you know, some, the same situation in the United States, we need a side with a cardiac surgeon for doing the TABA procedure. Uh, in our cath lab, we start the uh, TABA procedure from seven years ago, 2010. At the time, the, we do all patients do general anesthesia. So from two years ago, uh, we the more than 95% do conscious sedation is the uh, just a uh, minimalist type of approach. So that was our routine. However, and uh, our anesthesiologist uh, uh, strongly recommend, uh, uh, you know, some type of procedures uh, became our routine procedure, but uh, live demonstration is not routine. So anesthesiologist uh, has uh, recommend for general anesthesia for patient safety and another issue. So we did uh, uh, the, uh, this patient uh, general anesthesia. We now do uh, uh, type of procedure the, 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 our, the uh, old standard. So, and uh, is there any question for patient history and decision making? Yes, doc, Dr. Uh... Park, this is Ted Feldman. I'm, I'm very impressed with this aortogram that it looks like a porcelain aorta, which is an important yes, yeah. reason for a low-risk patient like this to undergo TAVR. Yeah, but, right. but I also wonder, as I watch this aortogram, on the outer curve of the aorta, uh, about halfway up, there appears to be a lucency. So it looks like there might be a very large plaque in the aorta. Yeah, right. Yeah, I wonder if you have a transesophageal echo that could settle this issue, or if on the CT scan you have an assessment of the root. Yeah, right, right. Is it, can you, the, Dr. Ho, can you check the ascending, the aortasm, atherosclerotic st status by TEE? I think the, or the, CT. Yeah, we're, well, we have the TEE live, so yeah, this, this right, will give right. us a good picture yeah, right away. Right, right. Uh, because on the outer curve there, of course, is where the TAVR delivery system and the wires are all going to go. And I, I think uh, we use TEE in almost all of our patients as part of the screening because it's so good for this plaque in the uh, proximal aorta. So here it, we see a plaque. There's a calcification uh, near the right-sided edge of the picture, but we certainly don't see a big mobile uh, Lesion. Yeah. So this patient has diffuse, diffuse atherosclerotic change on ascending aorta, but I'm not sure we can catch the like mobile, mobile plaque within this range. No, I agree. It does not look like there's mobile plaque. Do you have a CT yeah, graph yeah, to show CT. the or to arch? Uh, now, we have an autogram, but in uh, the presentation file, we yeah, didn't prepare, I'm sorry. Okay, please yeah. show later. Okay. Yes. And also, uh, the looking at the last uh, sizing chart, and so the, can you show the sizing chart for last slide? And uh, we have some, maybe, you know, some, that is the uh, uh, discussion point, uh, looking at the... Uh, so, uh, yeah, looking at the size of uh, mobile plug, will you change the mic for cover or you change your device choice for you really define some, something wrong in the audio? Well, if, if we see a large mobile plaque, uh, we have to reconsider the whole procedure because the risk of stroke is so great, either surgically or with TAVR. Yeah. Um, uh, how about uh, embolic protection devices in, in this situation? I mean, do you think that's a role? 
Uh, absolutely. I, I think no one can say, if, if we see a, a large plaque burden, we don't have the data yet for how much of a difference it makes, uh, but it certainly is attractive. I, I think that's a great comment. Also, will you consider an, an alternative access? Transapical or some other access? Apical still puts a wire right yeah. on yeah. the outer curve. Okay. Uh, right. So it's very, very difficult. Uh, we have done some with small mobile plaques and a lot of discussion with the family. Uh, we have a case coming up, in fact, with plaque distal to the left subclavian. So we're going to do the procedure via subclavian access. Uh, and have our second catheter via radial to avoid entirely being in the, the arch or descending yeah. aorta. Because a lot of these old folks, when they do the TEE, they have a lot of arthrobatous plaque in the aorta. So. Well, the, the trials have all used a plaque thickness less than five millimeters as acceptable. Okay. I think what scares us all is when you see a two or three centimeter mass that's moving around in the aorta, which is really frightening. I saw uh, an yeah, interesting, right. interesting yeah. finding. Uh, when we see the annulus and, and, and the LCC side, you can see a radio opaque classification that yeah, extends right. below the yeah. annulus, even though it is a very subtle classification. Yeah, definitely. We, we don't want to stop you from doing the procedure uh, either, so please work while we're talking. We're gonna do. And so, looking at the sizes, uh, we have the two choices, uh, 23. If you're going to select the 23, we did uh, oversizing. And if you select uh, 26, uh, we did undersizing. And we have some discuss over uh, heart team is SJFAG, you know, our uh, top faculty member. And this patient is, we're going to decide uh, to the select the valve size was 26. And then two cc on the field means our targeting usually area oversizing is uh, 110 so up to 115. So and uh, I'm gonna do the pre dilation. Is it, is it the previous features. Usually, so there are, I know the main debate uh, is uh, whether we do or not do is a pre dilation. But this is a live demonstration for much safer uh, the procedure and uh, the, some take time, the valve positioning. I'm going to do uh, pre dilation. Okay, what size balloon do you have? Uh, two sizes I'm pacing on. Okay, inflate. Okay, deflate. Okay, pacing up. The balloon size is 20 millimeters. Okay, we're gonna usually do is a two size down. Is a, if you select 23, we select 18. This is 26, we select 20. Dr. Feltman, how's your personal criteria to use pre balloon dilation? Right now, uh, in the United States, in the, the trials, pre dilatation is still required. Mm -hmm. Uh, and in day-to-day -day practice, it's infrequent. So there are, are definitely uh, operator biases about whether predilatation might be useful yes. when yes, the definitely. orifice is extremely small or when the valve is uh, extremely calcified. Uh, the other place where we have a lot of debate about the importance of predilatation is for the lotus valve as a different, entirely different mechanism of expansion, and uh, that's unsettled. But I think real day-to-day -day practice predilatation is pretty rare in the U.S. and Europe. My personal strategy to use pre balloony is twofold. The first one is bicuspid AS yes, because of the, uh, uh, it's difficult to determine the etiquette size of valve. The second uh, uh, condition is too tight stenosis to pass the big, uh, a big uh, rufous valve. Well, I, I think these are both very important points. The bicuspid uh, discussion, of course, is an entire day-long symposium uh, because we don't really know yet what is the best approach for bicuspid. Uh, the, the role of predilatation in bicuspid 
some of the same issues are problematic as with tricuspid. That is just how calcified. Some of the bicuspid patients are much younger and the tissue is more pliable. And I think we're going to learn a lot over the next couple of years about how to treat the bicuspid population specifically. Okay, we're going to go on over here. And then the, the matchy the device uh, on balloon. Is it? Okay, just a little more. Okay. Okay, we're going to do override the ascending aorta. It's gently. So the, the next generation Edwards valve, this step of uh, loading the, the stem frame onto the here. balloon won't be necessary. It will become even easier. In safari where it seems to be a little bit. Dr. Freeman, Dr. Zhang mentioned about the cerebral protection devices. So in the actual clinical practice, are you using cerebral protection in those highly selected high-risk patients? Cerebral protection is not uh, commercially available okay. in the United All right. States. So the whole experience in the U.S. is very limited with uh, trial experience. Um, I think internationally it's uh, enthusiastically embraced in some sites and much less so in others. And there are many factors, uh, not the least of which is cost with fixed reimbursement for, uh, for the TAVR procedures. And of course, the, the uh, uncertainty now of interpreting the clinical results. And the two extremes are you almost always retrieve debris. There's clearly an effect on the MRI findings. And on the other side, uh, less of a clear impact on the major clinical outcomes. Okay, I think that position is good. It's, uh, okay, ready? One more test. What's the size of bell? It's a 26. Under two CC. Okay. Okay, 준비됐죠? 자, 처음 처리한다. 자, patient one, patient one. 자, contrast detection. Okay, infrared. One, two, three, four, five. Deflate. Deflate. Okay, crashing off. Okay, great. So I think it's very subtle, but you can see, especially on the uh, non-coronary side, that the frame is not completely flat and straight, so that the underfilling strategy appears to uh, have been successful. Okay, the wire, the Sapari wire was uh, now still in the... El buoy, and then we're going to check the electrogram. Okay, Andrew. Should. Okay, can you check the T trans S parallel echo? There was have been some severe parabellar leaks. Well, this looks really good. Yes. You, you do appear to have a very good seal. And I don't think I noticed the coronary heights in the presentation, but it looks like there's at least some flow into both coronaries. Yeah, right. a, uh, left is a 17, yeah, the right okay. is a 15. Yes. The coronary height uh, is a sufficient uh, high height. Can we see the echo? Okay, uh, Dr. Hall, prepare. Oh, Deep sedation and transthoracic echocardiograph. There's, we have a poor resolution. QR's duration seems to become wider. <coughs> We're noticing that the QRS is wide, and I don't know that we saw clearly what it was at the baseline. Yeah, it's the initial the baseline, the slightly LBBB. 
Pure interval is also prolonged. But it's transient phenomenon, usually. You know, um, the, we started the Sapien 3 is, uh, nearly uh, seven months ago, and we did uh, nearly the 60 case uh, pacemaker insertion rate is just 2.5. Yes, yeah, that's 2.5. Okay. Okay, Quite low. We cannot say a call. <laughs> <laughs> that is a kind of problem, uh, minimalist okay, okay. approach. Uh, no, 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 this is a general, general anesthesia. A general? Yeah, why yeah, why right. don't you, uh, is, is it yeah, T? Yeah, I mean that, you know, as, as mentioned, <laughs> oh, the, okay. the, yeah, right, as mentioned, I mean, the, our, our routine is local anesthesia, but anesthesiologists uh, recommend, uh, you know, some the general anesthesia, this is a live demonstration. <laughs> So I think the angiogram looked like there was no aortic insufficiency and we should get, obviously, corroboration from the TEE, yeah, yeah, but it yeah, looks yeah, like right, a really right. uh, superb result. And I would, I would ask, I guess, for the sake of discussion, if there were a small paravalvular leak because of the potential for oversizing, I would be a little nervous about post-dilating okay. anyway. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Dr. Park? Would yeah. you please uh, remove okay. the stiff yeah. wire and okay, check the double tracing or okay. Okay, show sorry. us the final root autography okay. because okay, the other room is uh, ready for okay, live okay. demonstration. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. We're going to check uh, Angel again. Okay, Angel. Yeah, it's great. It's, I think there is no parvebrary. It's a result was excellent. Another projection to uh, separate yeah, okay. the background okay, of descending aortic guide. Okay, got it. Are you? Let it be. Cow down. Are you ready? Okay. Enjoy. Yeah. Yeah. I think there was no the part of yeah. The result was excellent. Looks like a great result. Yeah, okay. yes. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much for thank your you. nice thank presentation. You. Okay, thank we you. We are going to move on uh, to the uh, case three in the other room. The first operator is Dr. Darren L. Waters. Darren, would you please show your team and case? Okay. Uh, good morning, Hyacinth. Uh, Ted and others, uh, welcome to Assay Medical Center. We have a very interesting case for you that I'm sure is going to create some significant discussion. I'm going to ask Dr. Lee here to introduce the team. Yeah. I'm Dr. Lee and it's Dr. Pa. Uh, I introduce uh, this case. Uh, uh, this patient is 76 year old male man and admit with uh, dyspnea near class patient 3. Uh, the echocardiography shows severe degenerative AES with normal systolic AV function. Uh, yeah, he had uh, operation history uh, due to uh, hepatocellular carcinoma and early gastric cancer. Uh, his uh, estimated mortality is 1.7%. Euroscot uh, is uh, 1.03. Uh, he really wants to uh, tabby procedure uh, because the painful operation history. Uh, echocardiography is, uh, finding mean pressure gradient 40 mm Hg and aortic valve uh, maximal velocity is 4.2. 2D uh, planimetry measures uh, 0 0.7 uh, uh, and uh, peripheral angiography is uh, uh, iliofemoral excess. Uh, coronary angiography was done. Uh, uh, coronary angiography finding intermediate stenosis, left main shaft in IBUS measure. Uh, minimal lumen area is 7.2 mm square. We decided medical treatment for left main disease. Yes. Uh, peripheral angiography, uh, CT angiography finding is uh, without uh, no calcification, right external iliac artery diameter is 
uh, we decided the main uh, device uh, yeah, through the right area country. Next. Uh, annulus mean diameter is 26.1 millimeter and annulus perimeter is 81.4 for, uh, millimeter. ST, junk, uh, ST junction uh, and uh, annulus Asia ratio is uh, reference range. Uh, LVOT, annulus uh, area ratio is uh, normal range. Next. Uh, calcium score is uh, low uh, on uh, three cost, uh, aortic valve costs. Uh, coronary height is uh, enough for tabi implantation. Uh, finally, we uh, decided to sizing is uh, Sapiens 3 and 26 millimeter in this case. Okay, so there are a number of issues that this case raises that I think have been relevant to the discussions we've been having over the last few days. So we have a relatively young patient here. It's not an octogenarian, he's 72. We have a patient who has a low uh, STS score. So on any criteria, I think he is a low-risk patient, relatively young. Um, further, we have the issue of patient preference. This patient does not want open surgery. Finally, we have a problem with the technical aspects of the case. We have an issue where the sizing falls between, say, a 26 and a 29 sapien. So the question becomes, uh, what valve size are we going to put in? So there are a few points to discuss. Um, I can tell you we've be, um, begun the case while you were looking in the other room there. We have obtained access. Let's show us the access. We, I usually use a lemur catheter to identify the puncture site and we've uh, punctured, we've placed two proglides and the sheath, let's see that, and we have uh, done an aortogram here in the coplanar angle. Let's show us the crossing of the valve, it's done fairly easily. Uh, there is a mild, moderate calcification, go to the next. And we have uh, here, we've just used an amplat sign, a straight wire, and the, uh, the wire passed straight through. And then we've put a safari, a safari wire into the ventricle. That's just gone straight through, and then we've put a safari wire into the ventricle. So we are really set up now for TAVI. We have some of these unresolved issues that are worth discussing, and we need to decide on the sizing. Uh, this is H. S. Kim. Uh, it's a low risk patient with nearly no calcium. And when you select the 26 minute valve, the oversizing index is just 100 percent, zero uh, oversizing. Thus, is there any possibility of migration of the valve in this uh, relative size of valve to the annulus with nearly no calcium? I think there is a calcification on the fluoro, and I'll show you. Uh, I do think there's stenosis and some degree of calcification. Certainly not the most calcified valve. Um, and, but I think we will be about 5% oversized. I've taken several measurements around. It's around 500 uh, millimeters squared is the area, and as you know, we size Edwards on area. The problem, if we go to 29, this is the problem, is that we are over 20% oversized. And we have a low-risk patient who is uh, at risk for annular rupture if we significantly oversize the annulus. If we go down, if we go down the next size, we are not as oversized as we would like. But there's one thing about the Sapien 3 as opposed to the XT is it will grow a little. So if we're not happy, if we have some paravalvar leak, we may well be able to put a few mils in the balloon and re-expand it. So I think... The question becomes, do we risk annular rupture or paravalvar leak? What are the relative merits of both strategies? And how do we deal with annular rupture if we say get annular rupture? Catastrophic outcome versus if we have slight undersizing, then we may be able to overcome that by reinflation. I think 
without predilation and there is stenosis, that embolization is unlikely. How about overfilled by 2cc? Yes, um, we discussed that and I'd be open to overfilling by one or maybe even 2cc, the, the balloon. Um, I was less comfortable with going with a 29 and taking two or three mils out. And I think the company or Edwards would tell you they, they don't like to do that. They're not sure what that means for the outcome of the valve. Um, so I, I, I think in this situation, the other things I have carefully looked at, and this is another thing to consider in this sort of case, I've had a look at the STJ. Now the STJ is 30 on 3 Mencio, and you're going to be putting a 29 valve in. Then I've measured the height of the sinus. The height of the sinus is about 12 to 14 millimetres. So a 29 valve will be projecting very tightly into the ascending aorta. And I, I think this is not a good strategy. Certainly we'll be jailing the coronaries. Uh, and it'll be a, potentially a tight fit into the aorta. So that's the other thing to consider. Look at the annulus, look at the sinus uh, sizes, the STJ sizes and the aortic sizes, because you have, you have to fit the valve into that space. So, so, Darren, the, all of that said, uh, and I understand that you're, you may even have the, uh, the valve crimped and ready to go here, but being in between sizes, uh, Edward sizes, I think is an important place to consider a core valve because sure, you yeah. typically you'll, you'll find that you're right in the middle of a – they don't correspond. You'll find that you're right in the middle of a size – yeah. Uh, on the core valve side, and of course, uh, oversizing is forgiven with uh, core valve. Yeah. No, Especially if you're uh, worried uh, about annular rupture, then yeah, why, why not another alternative option using a self-expandable device? Yeah, I think they're all good suggestions. Um, I do think, though, you can treat this patient with a balloon expandable stent uh, device, TAVI device. Uh, and uh, I think that it's just a matter of correctly judging the situation and taking allowances for that. Okay, go ahead. Show us. Okay, so let's move along, and uh, we will get the valve ready now. We've got a wire in the ventricle. Uh, we've got our access. We've crossed the valve, put a wire in, measured the gradient. Uh, we are now set up with a good projection there with a coplanar angle. We're going to take the uh, device up. Now you're right, we did have prepped the device and uh, it is a Sapien 3. That's 26. We'll, we might put some extra mil in the, uh, in the inflator. Let's, how many mils do you recommend? I think we should start with at least one, possibly two mils if you want to overfill the the inflator. Why don't we put a mil in to start? One mil, thing. One mil. Well, this is, this is the art of Taver, so the volume yeah. is uh, a matter of uh, uncertainty. Having said that, this is still an acceptable, uh, still falls acceptably within the, the 26 range for, for the Edwards device. If I wanted to be difficult, I'd say 1.5. 1.5. I think we had that suggestion recently. 1.5. That's a diplomat. It's a, matter of it's a diplomat in you coming out. Okay. Okay. So we're gonna fix a wire. We're gonna pop okay. this. Uh, pop this in. Can we uh, just focus on the legs there? Come down to the uh, legs. Watch the valve come up and fix the wire. Okay, so can we go to 48 field, large field size, so we can see everything? You don't want to be focusing down here and not see the wire up in the heart. So that's the largest field size we have. So fix the wire. So I always like to see the wire there being fixed and not moving as we advance the device up. And I think it's really great, uh, Darren, to see you emphasize some of these really fundamental points because they are the most important. The other thing we like to do is have the E up, so we'll make sure that that's the case. And then the next strategy we're going to do is load the valve because, you know, we have to load that in the body, so just come around to the other side. And what we normally do is uh, unlock the valve and 
uh, get the assistant to make sure that the wire stays forward. And again, we can see the wire there. We don't want that coming back. And we're going to load up the valve and locking it. We're going to pull that on and load it up. And we're going to relock that. Okay. Now, if you go a little bit cranial, it'll assist with the loading of the valve and make sure that we're coplanar in this position. So we're going to finish the loading here. So we've got a little bit of cranial on that. And then we're going to keep it down until we've got it loaded. Okay, that looks pretty good. Okay, so the valve successfully loaded. Now we're just going to negotiate the arch and some of the little little points that are worth doing here is I always go to LAO so I can see the arch. And what we want to do is ensure that we are not pulling the wire out, but uh, there will need to be a little bit of action on the wire, a little bit of active traction as we come up. So what I'll do is uh, I break this down into a few steps here. We'll come up to the, to the arch when you're fixing the wire. Now, we're at the level of the arch. We're going to do some flexion on the catheter. That will take it off the outer curve, the bias. So it should, should go nicely around the arch. And you're going to fix the wire. My assistant here is going to fix that wire. We're just going to go gently. And just, it's, I think it's worthwhile keeping it moving rather than starting and stopping. Now we're going to go to implant angle. So we have the valve around the arch. We have it loaded. We're going to pull back the sheath so the balloon can expand in a minute, then cross. So let's get set up into our implant angle. That's pretty good there. Now we just need to go to a bigger field size so that we can see a little bit up. And uh, what I like to do at this point when we pull back the sheath is, is again keep a good eye that we're not moving things forward. So we've opened that up. And we're going to pull back. Just, just going to pull that back so that we can inflate the balloon. And so we're just you, about ready to cross now and look at deploying the valve. So, so you, Darren, you usually pull back before yeah. you've crossed. Uh, uh, I always do. Uh, uh, so maybe that's a personal thing, but uh, there's usually no problem pushing these across. And I like the, the catheter not to be as stiff. I like it to, to have less force. I think there's all, uh, very rarely have we had an issue crossing a valve. We haven't predilated here, obviously. Not a lot of calcium uh, as, as aortic stenosis goes for this patient. And uh, I like to take that sheath back before we cross. So we're, real, we're really set up now. We might do a little test to make sure our pigtail hasn't moved. So give us a little test there to, to, through our pigtail, guys. Give us a, a picture yep. with the contrast. That's it. Good. Inject. Okay, so that looks like a good spot. Our hemodynamics, before we cross, I always like to check the hemodynamics. Very stable patient. Blood pressure's been 110, 120. Whole time heart rate 70. We're in a good, good space to cross and deploy. And we've checked our pacing just before we came live, and we've had another look at our pacemaker. It looks good. And one thing I'll show you that I like to do is to do a dry run. We call it a dry run to make sure everything's working before we deploy. So I'll fix the wire. Yeah. So the assistant's fixing the wire, and we're just going to pop through just gently. And that's a nice spot to begin with. We are using that dot, and we want to sit the base of the dot on the annulus. And what I like to do is a dry run. So by a dry run, we're going to pace, and then we're going to inject, and then we're going to stop pacing and see what it looks like. We're not going to deploy, because sometimes the valve rises with rapid pacing, and we want to make sure everything's going to work on the dry run. So we're not going to deploy this time, so feel relaxed, and we're going to take a little picture, okay? So pacing on, injection... And pacing off. So we can stop now and reevaluate, and we can seek your impression on the position. My impression is that it's pretty good. Yes, wonderful. Is everybody happy with that position? Yeah. Yes. And the pacing worked well, the injection worked fine. So I think we're in a good space to begin, and this time we are going to deploy. 
So we're going to go live, everyone, and we're going to deploy this time. And I'm going to leave the pigtail there because rarely do we have a problem taking it out, so don't worry about the pigtail. So let's have pacing on, injecting, and deploying. Pigtail remote. He doesn't do that. It's just sound. Oh. So we're coming down, and we're going to come off with the pacing. Off pacing. A bit of a language, but that's all right. So, uh, and one thing I like to do is get the, the device out of the way so we're not obstructing the behavior of the valve. And we're just going to take that back a little. And it's looking good to me. And pressure recovery. And you can see, with the pigtail in place, where the device is relative to the annulus. This is a nice implant. Um, any comments on the, and the pigtail's out, on the conduction system? We're seeing a pretty small image, but it looks good. Yeah, it's narrow. So uh, let's take a picture here. Be, be, um, before you do that, uh, Darren, do you ever give a little tug to the wire to try to centralize it? We can do that. The bias of the safari is such that it's pretty stiff and tends to stick to the, the outer curve there. Um, it's probably better to put a pigtail in, take this stiff wire out. But rarely, if there are issues, you want to wire across. So before, I always do a check aortogram because if there are issues, you want to wire across. You don't want to be rushing to exchange things in a situation where there's a problem. So what we're going to do now is our first picture, post-valve implant. Um, we're pretty confident based on his clinical behavior that it's gone well. However, we, do ha we want to make sure things like the position's good, the paravalvular leak, there's, there's not significant paravalvular leak, and we also want to um, you know, make some uh, assessment of the coronary flow. And you'll notice we're not using TEE in this situation. He is under a general anesthesia. He would have been suitable, I think, for local. Uh, the issue, of course, is the gastrectomy, so that people are not wanting to intubate the esophagus and the, uh, and, the, and the stomach. So let's have a look at this picture. But I can tell from that by injecting and then deploying, I can see exactly where the position is. I can see exactly the fact that this is well-sized. I think a 29 could have been a real disaster here. So let's do a picture. Yep. Injecting. I'm very happy with that. There's not a lot of aortic regurgitation. I think it's valvular, what we're seeing, and it's mild with the wire across. I think we have a very good result here, uh, and the valve is nicely placed there in the sinuses. You can see coronary flow. You can see minimal paravalvular leak. We will check the hemodynamics, but I suspect that that will be very it, acceptable. It may not be paravalvular leakage because uh, there is a stiff wire. This, it may be due to transvalvular leakage. Yeah, that's what I think it is, and it's only mild. So let's take this out, guys. We're going to uh, come around to the arch. So let's go to a big field. When you're taking this out, it's also important because you can scrape the arch going in and you can scrape the arch going out. We, we don't want to cause any mischief at any point in the procedure. So we're going to take a look there and we're going to come off the flexion a little bit and we're going to come back around the arch very gently. And then I'm going to get Dr. Lee here to walk this out and I'll, I'll fix the grind sheet. So Dr. Lee, mm -hmm. uh, over to you. Let's walk this out and we'll do, uh, put a pigtail up and we'll get a final shot here. But what do you think about this patient? Please walk it out, doctor. Take it out. So, uh, what do you think about this patient? He's young. He has low risk. And he doesn't want surgery. So, is he, is he a partner three patient? No, because he won't be randomised. Is this going to be a problem for, for partner three? Well, partner three is challenging uh, to randomize. In the United States, a patient like this doesn't have quite the choice to just absolutely say they want to have TAVR. In fact, the choice that a patient like this has is either surgery or no therapy. Uh, so that, that discussion often helps a, a very low-risk patient make the decision. 
And uh, there's a good chance this patient would end up in Partner 3 in the United States. The uh, sticking point would be uh, an evaluation by an oncologist regarding 10-year survival because the mm -hmm. Partner 3 trial is going to have uh, a two-year endpoint and then uh, – much longer-term follow-up as part of the ongoing trial evaluation. When we perform a TAVI in high surgical risk with very uh, high age, then we can accept uh, mild leakage. But when it down to the TAVI to the young and low-risk patients, we really achieve a perfect results without any uh, mild leakage. Yeah, and that, that's what we're aiming to do here. I think we're aiming for no pacemaker, we're aiming for no paravalvular leak, uh, and you know, this is a patient you could probably discharge tomorrow. Why are then? Also, we have to consider the future TAVI and TAVI, as we have to keep in mind sure. to maintain effective orifice area as wide as possible in selecting device. Thank you. Personally, I would like to choose Ablatar for these patients because it provides the largest area for this area. This patient has a really negligible carcinoma amount, expecting small, smallest leakage even we uh, implant Ablatar. So here is the, uh, the hemodynamics. There's no gradient. You can calculate the AR, AR index, but the principle here is the EDP is very low. Di uh, relative to the diastolic pressure. And there's good separation, there's good diacrotic notch. So we have a situation in which we are reasonably happy about the AR index. By all means, calculate it. We're going to do a pullback here. Are we ready for a pullback? Well, let's do a picture first with the... Can we have the echo just off for a second? The transthoracic echo, could you just step back? Oh. Because we are x-raying. So they're very enthusiastic here. Um, let's do a little uh, picture, a autogram picture, please. Now we've just got a pigtail across. Really nothing much there. We pull out the pigtail in the ventricle. Pulling out the pigtail. So what do you think of the height? Pigtail is out. We're going to do that picture again. To no gradient. Minimal. And you're better than 80-20. It's a nice, uh, very nice implant height. Yeah, you're not going to get conduction issues at this height. Um, you're just not in the region there of the, uh, the node. We've not caused any injury. The QRS <coughs> is narrow. The PR interval is good. And uh, I think we've got a good result here for this patient. Um, and this is what we aim to get in patients who have uh, low risk, who are young, and we expect to do well. So. Did you do 1.5 milliliter overfill? 1.5? Uh, I did 1.25. How's that? Because <laughs> I, I am a diplomat too. Like we don't want any trouble in this part of the world. Okay. And also, you know, in the Asian countries, we got a lot of patients who or do not accept surgical open heart well. So we got many patients belong to a low risk category, symptomatic. They prefer uh, tarpal procedures. Well, in that sort yeah, of scenario, look, look, then it involves the heart team, probably involves yeah, the look, other parties. I don't to, think it's a. To see I whether we can do it on a compassionate grounds. So, you know, patients symptomatic, mm. uh, uh, they refuse surgery. The only option may be tarpal. So we need a, a more multidisciplinary. Uh, in, in, in my country, we were still doing TAVI after full examinations on the compassionate grounds, uh, apart from clinical trial, of course. This is our look, situation um, that we're facing. I agree. And look, I don't think it's just uh, in Asian countries. Nobody wants their chest cracked. I, I know this is a little bit of a secret that nobody's shared with the surgeons. No one actually wants the sore or their chest open if they can avoid it. And even in Australia, we're pretty chicken. If we, can have it, if we can have the same treatment without opening the chest, they're going to go for it every time. And in fact, patients uh, are very proactive in seeking out this therapy. Uh, you know, they're on social media, they're on the internet, and they know what's available, and they're voting with their feet about the treatment. 
As far as, as, far as um, um, availability of multiple valves, um, how do you go about choosing which patient for which device? I mean, we got, um, uh, we got Lotus, which unfortunately got pulled out. Uh, we got Medtronics, we got Edwards. How do you choose your device? Uh, do you go by anatomy? Is it going to be a, a device uh, for specific patients, for specific anatomy? How, how do you choose devices uh, for specific patients? Okay. And you're asking me that question? Yeah. Um, I gave a little lecture yesterday exactly on this question because I think it's important. Uh, and I do believe that you, you shouldn't just be a one-valve doctor because I don't think any valve is absolutely perfect. And you need to know the pitfalls, the pros and cons, benefits and issues with every different valve on the market and you should then tailor the needs of the patient to what valve you select. And, you know, like I said uh, yesterday, my algorithm is to start with the annular size, look at the annular size first because that will determine what to some degree what type of valve you might be able to use. Look at the degree of calcification, particularly whether there's aortomitral calcification. This may be, uh, you know, a concern if it's very heavy. For a balloon expandable valve with the risk of annular rupture, you may want to consider a self-expanding or mechanically expandable device. If it's very heavy, mechanically expandable devices may find it hard. You may find difficulty locking. If you then go to the structures adjacent to the annulus, and this is how I systematically work through it, I look at the coronary heights. The coronary heights low or are they acceptable? If they're low, consider a self-expanding, fully retrievable and repositionable valve, not a balloon expandable because you can't take it back. Um, you can use a partially retrievable valve like Elevolute R or a fully retrievable valve like Lotus, but unfortunately it's not available currently. After coronary heights, I go to the next adjacent structures, which of course are things like the septum. Do you have a sigmoid septum, a big septal bulge? Is this going to cause a problem for a balloon expandable valve and embolization? That may make you consider self-expanding. Is the next thing is the aorta? Is the aorta horizontal or is the angulation favourable? Go beyond that to left ventricular function. Assess the left ventricular function. Is this a ventricle that will tolerate rapid pacing, or do we need another valve that we don't need pacing for? Um, so, the, and then finally, I go to the, ac the uh, access. How are you going to get there? And you need adequate femoral diameter. If you're down to 5 millimetres, you're looking at Evolute R, 5 to 5.5. Five. Above 5.5, five, five, you can look at 14 French systems like Evolute R or Sapien 3. If you've got very big calibre femorals, then you have an open playing field. So I would systematically work through all of these things in every patient and try and select the valve that's going to give you the best chance of a good outcome. And by knowing the valves and having good experience with different valve types, you can then make a very informed and clinically appropriate uh, selection to get the optimum outcome. So I think it's horses for courses. You do need a workhorse valve, and workhorse valve for me is the Sapien. It's, uh, you know, it's best in breed, I think. Um, and, but you must have familiarity with all valve types and self-expanding is important to have in the armamentarium. Okay, thank you very much for your nice presentation, Dr. Wartos. Thank you. Okay, we are going to move on the lecture session. So, under the title of Advantages and Disadvantages of Three Available Valves in Korea. The first is Sapian 3 by Dr. Kentaro Hayashita from uh, Keio University, Japan. I thank you very much, Dr. Kim, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to talk about advantage and disadvantage of the Sapien 3. And if we compare uh, two major players, uh, Bloom and the self expandable valve, maybe the core valve has some drawback of the uh, more PBL pacemaker, and the uh, Sapien valve also had the drawback like the uh, anus rupture and STJ injury and the coronary occlusion. Even though the incidence is uh, very low, once it happens, it will be really fatal. And if we look at the data from choice trial, uh, uh, the obviously the balloon expandable valve uh, had the lower incidence of PBL compared to self-expanding valve, but there was no big difference between two valves. 
And for example, 83 years old female, and uh, she has really heavy calcification of the three uh, leaflets. And as you can see, the, uh, the calcium is just in front of the uh, coronary artery. So we perform the uh, angiography with the uh, ballooning. And this root shows, uh, clearly show the, uh, um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, not semi-occlusion, but the, uh, the risk of the coronary occlusion. So therefore, we chose the uh, self-expandable valve rather than the uh, expandable valve. But the, for this kind of a case, we can put the uh, coronary protection post in device. And pacemaker is also very important. And uh, of course, the uh, balloon expandable valve needs the uh, pacemaker. And once the uh, one beat of the uh, pacemaker failure happens, it will be a really uh, bad uh, result. So we need to be really careful of the uh, rapid pacing. And narrow ST junction is also a, a kind of a limitation for balloon expandable valve. As you could see, um, that not only the valve, but also the balloon can uh, injure the uh, severely calcified STJ. So we need to be careful of the uh, very small STJ when we want to use the balloon expandable valve. And the, this patient is the, uh, treated conservatively and discharged at uh, for day, uh, 13, day 30. And for the verb in valve procedure, uh, we can use valves, but the, uh, because of the interannual uh, nature of SEPIN device, maybe SEPIN has the uh, higher gradient, especially in smaller annual patient compared to the uh, self-expanding valve, like core valve. And for this kind, of, for this kind of the LVOT calcification, it is known as to cause the uh, uh, annual rupture. But the advent of the uh, this SEPIN3 device, we can treat this kind of patients as the Dr. Kim has beautifully demonstrated uh, the de in the lab demonstration yesterday by the uh, meticulous control of the inflation volume. So I think the uh, abiotic calcification is less risky and less uh, to be controversial for the uh, blood expandable valve. And for this kind of bicuspid valve, uh, there were some argument uh, which device is better for this kind of case. And of course, the, uh, sometimes the, uh, as a level of the sinus of the uh, server, the uh, smallest part of the uh, aerotic valve complex uh, will be not as a level of anus, but as a level of the uh, sinus of the uh, server. So sometimes we need to do the uh, super annular sizing, and we don't know what is the uh, gold standard for the measurement of bicuspid valve. And for example, for this case, a uh, 42 years old female, uh, she had the, uh, only 20,000 platelet count, and she also had HLA mismatch transfusion. Therefore, uh, she was sent to the uh, type of procedure. And after balloon sizing, we put the 20 millimeter sepin 3 device. Even though she had really severely calcified the valve, we can meticulously control the inflation volume, even uh, during the inflation. And finally, the patient was discharged on day three. So uh, if we use the uh, SEPIN device, we can have the uh, less regurgitation. And uh, if the patient had really small aortic annulus, maybe we can choose the uh, separate annular uh, TABI device. And uh, according to the data from Assam Medical Center, if we use the SEP3 or Lotus valve, uh, it will lead to the less incidence of the PBL more than mild. So this kind of a second generation device will be very useful for uh, the patient with bicuspid valve. And we, in, in our hospital, uh, we usually choose the uh, no predilatation strategy for SEP3 device. And this case is the only one um, that we couldn't cross uh, without predilatation. And this patient has severe kyphosis. 
For this kind of case, the orbital could be really horizontal, and uh, in this case will be really difficult to treat with the uh, core valve or as a self-expanding device because it will be really difficult to achieve coaxial. But the, uh, we could achieve the uh, coaxial position with seven device, but we couldn't cross the aortic valve, so we needed to uh, do the uh, pre dilatation from the uh, contralateral side. And finally, we could deploy the valve uh, in the horizontal way. And uh, if we look at the data from the partner to trial, according to the accumulation of experience and improvement of the device, uh, we can see the very low uh, thirty-two motility with balloon expandable valve. And even for high-risk patient, uh, the 2% motility was observed for the STS score of 80%. And for intermediate risk patient, uh, we can see the uh, less incidence of the mortality as well as stroke rate. And uh, by propensity match uh, scoring, uh, the SEPIN3 demonstrated the uh, superiority compared to surgical ABR. And I'd like to introduce our data from Japan. Now we are organizing Ocean Tabby Registry, which consists of 14 centers, uh, which has the more than 50 cases per year. And our registry also covers almost one third of the uh, population of Tabby in Japan. And the mean age is 84, and the mean STS score was 8%. And 30 the mortality was 1.7 and the uh, OE ratio was 0 0.2. But in this registry, the most of the patient uh, were treated with the uh, uh, in this registry, most of the patient uh, were treated uh, with sepin XD, not sepin 3 or core valve. So I think the, even with the older generation valve, we could achieve very good result, very thanks to the uh, Western experience and Asian preceding at Asian uh, experience. And in our hospital, uh, even though we have done only 150 of sepin 3 and in hospital mortality was zero and major vascular complication was noted in only one patient, and uh, a little bit uh, slightly higher pacemaker implant tension rate compared to sepin XT, but the very good result. And the uh, current indication is the uh, intermediate risk patient, but now, so we are uh, moving to the lower risk patient. And pattern three trial will compare the TABR and SABR in the low risk patient. And we are really honored to be part of uh, this pattern three trial. And uh, the, the three Japanese center will join this uh, pattern three trial. And we are really honored to be part of this trial. And in conclusion, SEPIN3 provides less probable leak, less bas vascular complication, and low pacemaker implantation rate, and better coaxiality. And these improvement points uh, led to uh, simplifying the procedure, lower mortality, and better outcomes. But the care should be taken for the uh, special anatomy. Thank you very much for your attention. Great, thanks uh, for your nice lecture, Dr. Hayashita. The next speaker is Dr. Eberhard Grube, University Hospital Bonn, Germany. You'll talk about advantages and disadvantages of Abel to R. Mr. Chairman, uh, esteemed panel members, I know it's a provocative title talking about advantages and disadvantages about a certain valve. I know you'd like to hear that. Um, you also know that it depends widely on your personal preference on your personal experience, and therefore I would like to uh, share my own view and of course what we can present to you as far as data are concerned. Many of these things are personal, many of these things you could argue about this or that particular valve, but I think it's good to kind of summarize what we see. Evolute R follows on a foundation provided by 10 years of clinical experience with Corelf Classic. The goals of this presentation are to leverage experience gained with Corvaf Classic in various clinical populations and demonstrate the specific utility of the self-expanding platform. To show specific instances where the improved features of Evolute are such as lower profile delivery system and the ability to recapture the valve provide further advantages. 
to show specific instances where there is still room for improvement with the Evolute R system and understand the early results from the next generation Evolute Pro system. If we look at the design features, the Evolute R is a self-expanding night mode frame with porcine pericardial superannular valve, optimized ceiling with an extended skirt and more comf uh, conformable frame. It is a recapturable valve with an annual range 18 to 30 millimeters and four valve sizes, 23, 26, 29, and 34 millimeters. 14 French equivalent profile vessels up to from five up. 34 millimeter system, 16 French equivalent vessels larger than 5.5 millimeters. Looking at the two clinical trials, the Evolute RCE study in Europe with 60 patients and Evolute RUS IDE study with 250 patients. Summarizing, in the upper part, the European trial, the lower part, Evolute RUS trial, we're looking at all cause mortality. In blue, 30 days, in yellow, one year, disabling stroke, permanent pacemakers, moderate and severe PVL, and major vascular complications. We see both cohorts demonstrate an increase in the percent of patients with non-trace PVL over time, both in Europe, as you can see here in green, and also in uh, the U.S. Evolute, in the uh, Evolute U.S. study here with 76.6% uh, 76 no or trace um, PVL. Hemodynamics, very well known to all of you, very low gradients, remain stable in both trials up to two years with excellent hemodynamic forward flow parameters. If we look at the real-world outcomes in over 5,000 patients that have been reported, we can see 30-day permanent pacemaker, 18.3%, PVL, moderate severe weight, 6.3%, major vascular complications, weighted average, 2.4%, and all stroke, weighted average, 3.1%. Now let's look at some specifics where the self-expanding Evolute R platform might be advantageous. If we look at the small vasculature and you look at the, at the, at the small sheath size, you can see here 5.0, Evolute Pro 5.5 due to its low profile. The Evolute platform has the potential to reach 17% more patients than Sapien XT or Corvaf Classic and 7% more patients than Sapien 3 simply based on the selection of axis. We look at patients at high risk for annular rupture. We do have today a patient-centered approach. Multi-slice CT is the gold standard tool for pre-TAVI assessment of the aortic root anatomy and it should be used in all indicated cases. We have to carefully see whether we oversize or undersize the valve with the consequences summarized here, oversizing conduction disturbances and annular rupture, undersizing need for a second valve, valve embolization, and paravalvular leak. So select an appropriate bioprocesses type and size. In cases where the valve is the borderline between two sizes, the relative complication risk should be considered for each individual patient. Annular rupture, as been said by the previous speaker, is very rare, but if it occurs, it is catastrophic. And, as you can see here, it is typically associated with balloon expansion and therefore very uncommon with self-expanding valves. As you can see here, 0.2% in Corvaf extreme risk early trials, none in advanced Corvaf high risk and Evolute R CE study. Failing surgical aortic bioprosthesis, a very important, potentially even more important topic as we move into younger age groups. The superannual design maximizes forward flow. Surgical bioprosthesis often fail due to stenosis, which reduces the effective orifice area. It can be difficult to gain back the space with TAF and SAF, especially in small annuli. There might be an advantage of a self-expanding valve, the superannular leaflets optimize forward flow and maximize the potential effective orifice area. The 23 millimeter core valve bioprosthesis is indicated to treat failed surgical valves with a 17 millimeter internal diameter. The pivotal trial expanded use in the US, TAF and SAF, 
Taff and Saf using core valve was studied in the US pivotal trial expanded use. Patients were at high risk, at high surgical risk, with a mean surgical aortic valve age of 10 plus minus 4.6 years. 60, uh, sorry, 36 percent of the failed surgical aortic valves were small, either 19 or 21 millimeters. And you can see here the outcome using core valve has been excellent with an all-cause mortality rate of 13.4 percent at one year. Here you can see all-cause mortality or major stroke in yellow and all-cause mortality in blue. The lifetime management, durability. Co-optation in non-circular anatomy might be problematic in the long video of this valves. Super annular valve design decouples the new leaflets from the native annulus minimizing the impact of calcium and annular ellipticity on leaflet motion and co-optation. It also provides unsurpassed hemodynamics and might increase durability. It has shown in the previous randomized trials, TAVR had significantly better valve performance versus SAVR at all follow-ups, highly statistically significant. Stable hemodynamics over time suggests the absence of leaflet degeneration out to five years now. Here, the dates are shown up to three years. In the advanced studies out to four years, hemodynamics remain stable at four years, suggesting the absence of leaflet degeneration, both orifice area in white and in orange mean gradient. Patients at high risk for coronary obstruction Metronic recommends implantation in patients with coronary osseous height more than 14 millimeter. However, the self-expanding valve may still be a better choice in patients at high risk for obstruction. Tapered shape of the frame diminishes the risk. If needed, coronary access can be achieved through the struts of the frame. Evolute can completely be recaptured in an emergency situation, which might be an advantage given that problem. Paravalvular leak. The rates of moderate and severe PVL in contemporary practice are low due to the sealing skirts and careful sizing practices using multi-slice CT. Mild PVL continues to affect a significant proportion of patients, summarizing all these trials mild in blue, moderate and severe in yellow. We can manage paravalvular leak both by post dilatation post can be used to reduce paravalvular if the frame does not fully expand. Data from the Corvav US pivotal trial confirmed the effectiveness of this technique as shown here, at 50.8 and 58.1% before post dilatation versus 14.6 after post dilatation. And that is the final result, <clears throat> final PVL result in all patients, none and mild in the majority of cases. So this is one way of dealing with this. The other way, is the next generation of this device, the Evolute Pro. Evolute R has an added pericardial tissue wrap. It provides greater surface area contact with the native annulus, reduces open spaces between the frame struts, and enhances healing response due to pericardial tissue properties and increased surface contact. Both studies, Evolute Pro in the United States, shows there were no patients with more than mild PVL at 30 days, completely abandoned moderate PVL. The valve demonstrated excellent hemodynamics with a new PPI rate of 10% at 30 days, both. Data improved for moderate PVL, abandoned, and the pacemaker rate here is 10% as shown on this slide. Conduction disturbances. Despite new techno technological advantages, new conduction disturbances and the need for permanent pacemakers follow TAVR remain an issue for all valves. The good news is the studied out to three years have demonstrated no impact of pacemakers on mortality, but this needs to be monitored over the long term, especially in patients with fewer competing comorbidities. Why does that happen? The complete answer is definitely not known. However, we do know that the problem arises when the TAV comes in contact with the conductive tissue. 
Studies with all contemporary valves have shown that new conduction disturbances are more likely with deeper implants. Control of implants depth to less than 5 millimeter is the best way to minimize, and here a recapturable valve might be advantageous over a, self over a uh, mechanically expanding valve or balloon expandable valve. So, final thoughts, ladies and gentlemen. The self-expanding platform offers the following specific advantages. Slow, steady deployment, a frame that conforms to the annulus, avoiding rapid pacing. The valve can completely eliminate the need for a balloon, offers the smallest available delivery system, has superannular function, Cautial labeling has been removed from TAF and SAF, end-state renal and low-gradient, low-output patients. Potential problems, moderate PVL and pacemaker rates. The newest generation Evolute Pro valve shows promising PVL and pacemaker rates without compromising valve performance. Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, uh, present advantage and disadvantage of Lotus Valve. The third one, advantage of Lotus Valve is showing a perfect result in tough situation, safest results in risky situation. I'd like to show two cases uh, with patients with elevated classification or um, bicuspid AS. This is a risk of, uh, associated with risk of leakage or tear. Thus, the lotus valve is preferred to minimize the leakage and to avoid the risk of a tear with complete repositionability. That can provide a chance to reduce implantation of pacemaker. Advert classification is shown here. It's a little bit uh, concerned to use balloon expandable valve and shaping. I'd like to maintain the whole system as high as possible to avoid a scratch in conduction system by adjusting the distal edge of post around endless plane from the start. Then uh, layover, when you see the indentation is fixed, then you have to push forward the whole system to layover. This is a unique procedure only in Lotus Bell that may be associated with safety concern because such a push forward movement may cause a frictional force around aortic arch. That may cause aortic dissection, especially in small body sized elderly female. We can check the coronary flow anytime, just until just before the release. It's a very safe system. And checked color, buckle, and post. The disadvantage of this system is too complicated, taking a long period of learning curve. That is a not good point for this system. It's very complicated. But if you accustom to it, you really enjoy the perfect results as shown here. We can see a tremendous effect of biased stiff wire that can produce transvalvular regurgitation. After removal of stiff wire, no regurgitation. Excellent results, excellent AR index, because no leakage. The trade-off is uh, LV conduction delay. Before TAVI, immediate after TAVI, one day we can see a little bit change of ST segment. That is secondary change of LBBB that emerge next day, as shown here. LBBB delayed onset around three days because of the local edema. Then five day, seven day, stable. Thus, uh, we always uh, keep the patients until a week because the cost of hospitalization is cheap in Korea and conduction disturbance is very dynamic. So I really check the stability of LBBB until at least seven days. Bicuspid AES, 
is good indication for lotus <coughs> because it provides excellent efficacy and safest device. Balloon velocity. Then 23, 27 millimeter lotus decided sheathing. When you see the indentation, layover, push forward whole system, that may cause a safety concern. Okay, release. No regurgitation. Especially no rupture because it's self expanding. No rupture, ideally. Theoretically, no rupture. And it's very effective, no leakage. That's the beauty of lotus valve, especially for bicuspartic valve stenosis. Shown here. I always try to implant as high as possible, just one millimeter ventricular. Perfect AR index, pressure gradient disappeared. Let's see the ECG change. One day after, good. In this case, even though there is a huge uh, uh, indentation because uh, we implanted a big, bigger valve to reduce leakage, no conduction abnormality in these patients because of very high implantation. No touch in the uh, LB uh, left bundle uh, fiber from the start of uh, deployment. This advantage is shown here, bulky system, layover process may cause damage on the outer. Outside fabric to reduce leakage may cause more pressure on the left bundle, resulting in AV conduction disturbance. Outer damage, I can show you one case that I experienced. Female, but the mass index is not so small, but stature is a little bit small, female. Base, baseline uh, root arthrography is good. Unsheathing process. Try to maintain the distal edge of post as high as possible around the analyst plane from the start of deployment. Layover, mild indentation, layover process. And depth is good. Locked between buckle and post. Checking the multiple uh, projection to see the optimal implantation depth. Good implantation depth. Then we can start release phase. Just before, until the, before uh, this phase, we can recapture anytime. 100% recapturability. That is a little bit different from the Avalotar. 80% recapturability because there is a point of no return of recapture in Avalotar system, but no point of return in this system. Then optimal depth then we can avoid complete AV block. No regurgitation. That's a unique feature of lotus system. No regurgitation. Pressure gradient disappeared. Press pressure is good. AR index always more than 30. Let's see the it change. Before TAVI, immediate after TAVI, one day, today. Even though there is high implantation, there is sudden sub, mis, uh, mismatch between the valve size and inner size. Such kind of local edema may induce LBBB. Third day, four days, stabilized. But at fourth day, she complained uh, of like pain. So I checked. CT aorta, we can see the dissection here. Because, probably because of the frictional force during the process of layover. Here, distal aortic dissection, next day, 
stabilized, then she can be discharged without any further problem. Is it change at eighth day? The same LBBB. Eleven day resolved a little bit. It's very dynamic. In any way, AV conduction disturbance is really a trade off, uh, Achilles tendon of lotus valve system. But that can be solved partly due to technical uh, improvement. It's very high implantation, just one millimeter depth. We can achieve such kind of high implantation because this system is 100% recapturable. No issues change. Technical tips uh, for perfect results of lotus valve is my personal strategy to prevent AV block. That is only a standard of lotus system adjust the distal edge of post at the analyst level from the start by gentle push of wire into LB to prevent deep dive of bell. Frequently happen in the lotus system. In our series of 24 patients, about 40 patients were treated with lotus in Korea. More than half patients were treated in SN hospital. In just two cases of pacemaker implantation, 8%. First case, Develop complete AV block immediately after balloon, not lotus bell. Just one case with severe calcified bikes AS needed pacemaker implantation. Thank you very much for your attention. I just wanted to make one comment about pacing. I think that's really important for all of the technologies. Uh, you made the point very well that pacing uh, or conduction disturbances are dynamic in the period after uh, valve implant, and this is true with all of the devices. Um, we have a lot of experience and a little bit of reporting that shows that at least half the patients are not requiring, that get a new permanent pacemaker, don't require it at six months. And uh, I don't think we've capitalized enough on this understanding in terms of improving our strategies for intermediate duration pacing. Uh, and of course, everybody's working on better ways to implant. Uh, the next generation Lotus will have it or has a top-down shortening to minimize this problem. But I think, I think we're appreciating that we should be able to improve pacing uh, more than many of the other challenges we have with TAVR. We have to maintain this session a little bit more because there's subtle problem in the uh, preparation of next live case. Thus, we have uh, several minutes to continue yeah. discussion a little bit more. <laughs> Very good. Uh, uh, any other comments? I, I would say, you know, all of the valve platforms are evolving, and uh, Eberhard showed the uh, Evolute Pro, which will be the next version of the core valve. Uh, we have another two versions of uh, Lotus in the pipeline, so that we'll see many of these challenges addressed as each platform specifically tries to go after its own biggest limitations. and. Uh, uh, we're in a, a stage now where the improvements are coming at a very steady rate because we have identified the big problems. Well, I see the uh, Japanese registry data, Ocean uh, Tavi registry in Japan. Uh, more than 90% of registry patients received a uh, second uh, XD or 3. Uh, we all acknowledge the AG and body size uh, patients registered in Japanese registry is uh, very old and small. Thus, I consider the self expand belt is really needed in Japan. How do you expect change of market share in Japan between Evolute R and Sapen 3? Thank you very much. Uh, actually, uh, our registry includes from the 2013 to 2016 July, and uh, we first uh, set in XT, and then uh, from 2016 January, we had a COBA, 
and 2016 of the May, uh, we studied the CPN3. That's the reason why the, in our registry, 90% of the patients were treated by a very expendable device. And I totally agree with you that the, uh, because we have a lot of patients with small body size, like small aortic cannulas and small inner femoral axis. And uh, I think uh, it would be nice to choose the Evolute R small one for small annulus as well as small interferon axis. And I've heard that the current market share is 75% versus 25% between CPN3 and Evolute R. And we don't have a lot as yet. For the uh, latest uh, three months or two months? Maybe three months. Three months something. business, three months, market share between seven three and yeah. Still very uh Sapian three is uh, prevailing. Maybe because we studied from Sapien, everyone is familiar with Sapien. Yeah. Well that's the only reason. Yeah. Can I have a question? So although the next generation valve are getting smaller and smaller, but vascular side complication is still very important. There's still a small group of patients that got very bad femoral Access. So in that group of patients, what well, would the panel think is the best alternative access? Abico, aortic, subclavian, carotid, or, or cavo, or all these fancy things? Any comment or idea? One thing I think has become very clear is that avoiding entry into the thoracic cavity is better than not. So that apical has moved kind of to the end of the line unless there's no other way. Uh, and transaortic is just a little bit better. It's, you've still got to enter the thorax, but at least you don't damage the ventricle. Uh, but for all the rest of it, it becomes very patient-specific. I know that there are the, the people who have experience with transcable become increasingly enthusiastic, and I can say this is true at our site, um, because once you understand the procedure and you get over the, uh, the learning curve, it's not only very much like transarterial transfemoral, uh, but in many respects it's even easier for the patient because the large venous puncture is a much quicker recovery even than the arterial puncture. Uh, but that said, there are sites that become very good at subclavian. I think carotid is a niche Procedure. The patient who is ideally suited may be great, but I don't think that's very common. So, what, what is the current optimal idea to cross the tunnel between the uh, venous and the outer? If the trans, what is the optimal way to cross the tunnel? So, for the transcaval procedure, the the most important part, uh, like with really everything in, in TAVI, is the planning and the assessment. So the, the biggest step is making sure the anatomy is suitable. And the, the problems, these are patients who tend to have more arterial calcification. Mm -hmm. So they have to have a soft spot in the infrarenal aorta that is adjacent to the IVC. Mm -hmm. And some of these patients just don't have it. Uh, the other big problem is the presence of uh, bowel in between the IVC and the aorta. Uh, but absent those problems, uh, when you see that the inferior vena cava and the aorta are within a centimeter of each other, and you have, it doesn't have to be much of a puncture point, but a soft spot in the inferior aorta, uh, then all the rest of it is the technical exercise. Uh, the, the whole learning curve with the closure is that at the very beginning of this procedure, the feeling was that the closure device had to span between the aorta and the IVC. We make no attempt to close the IVC now. So a duct occluder left in the aorta, if it's relatively hemostatic in the aorta, creates this shunt into the inferior vena cava. And uh, it's a little frightening when you start doing this, but once you realize that that it's a, a very stable and controllable uh, procedure. It's actually very attractive. You know, we have, um, for whatever reason, the patients we do uh, oftentimes have a lot of disease in the femoral arteries. We still have um, uh, maybe 90, 90 plus percent of the procedures done through the femorals. 
And what we end up doing is having to modify access, balloons, um, you know, sheathless deliveries of the valves. Um, and, and, you know, we have uh, basically avoided uh, having to uh, move away from the femoral arteries, but just uh, doing peripheral work at the same time. Well, it, that has, it, it works up to a point, but there remain these cases that are just absolutely horrible for transfemoral. I, and I think another thing that we've seen as part of the big learning curve through the development of TAVI over the last decade is uh, that femoral complications actually have bumped up a little bit each time we get a lower profile system because everybody pushes it a little bit. And then we sort of figure out what the limits are. Uh, so it is a continuous process. Uh, I'd, I'd say also that the existing size access sheaths are also improving. So it, it's iterative, and uh, you know every year things seem to get better. And the, obviously now the proportion of transfemoral uh, has gone way up compared to being 50% uh, with the Generation 1 equipment. I, I wanted to discuss... Uh, the further to the uh, conduction disturbance now because, because we are now moving forward to the uh, low risk group part of patient was uh, very young younger than the 70 so I, 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 we have known that uh, the EVOLUAR improved to the pacemaker rate lower to the 10 percent but we just we cannot just see the pacemaker rate we need to see the conduction disturbance rate because long-term pacing or long-term that bundle brain block will also uh, uh, this affect the LV function more than 10 years later. So how I want to discuss that, that how low conduction disturbance rate that we can accept for the patient younger than 70 years old. You know, we have two big randomized trials that are going on right now. And uh, I think that's what we're going to learn from the trials because um, Whatever the, the pacing and conduction abnormality rate is in TAVR, the only other alternative for the low-risk patients is surgery. And the, the rates in the surgical trials will define to some degree what the ideal target is for the TAVR patients. And the intermediate and high-risk surgical control arms don't give us those numbers. It really is different in the low-risk uh, population. Okay, uh, they are ready for live demonstrations, so I close uh, this session. Thank you very much for your participation.